It's finally time to learn how to grow loofahs. I documented all of my 2021 growing season, filmed over 1,000 video clips, and harvested dozens of beautiful loofahs. Since this is my in-depth loofah growing guide, this video will be long. I want to pack a lot of information into this video so when you are done watching, you will be equipped and ready to successfully grow your own loofahs. But I'll put timestamps down in the description to help you navigate through the info. This is part three of my loofah growing series, so if you missed parts one and two, be sure to watch those as well. And if this is the first time you've ever heard of loofahs, they are a gourd that develops a fiber that can be used as a sponge. Yes, these sponges grow on a plant, and this video is all about how you can grow loofah gourds in your backyard too. So let's get started with the first step for growing loofahs, deciding where to plant. I'm going to break this down into four parts that all happen to alliterate, so that's fun. First up is sun. Loofahs love sunlight. In my opinion, this is the most important factor in deciding where to plant. My loofahs loved growing on this arch in full sunlight, and some vines planted on my south-facing porch also did quite well. These vines on an east-facing porch that only got a half day of sun didn't produce as many gourds. Next, consider how much space you have in your sunny spot. Loofahs can get really long, up to 30 feet. They also shoot off side branches from the main vine that can get quite long as well. So don't plant your loofahs too close to other plants because the loofahs can and will take over. This vine in our garden box is a single loofah plant. A seed ended up in the garden box and this rogue loofah took over my mom's tomato cages and made it really difficult to harvest tomatoes. The vine even spilled out both sides of the box and started growing along the ground and on this rosemary plant. So with that in mind, you want to provide your loofahs with a sturdy and somewhat large support system. Technically, you don't have to grow them on a trellis or support structure and can let them grow on the ground. But I strongly recommend against this because the gourds are less likely to dry out well on the ground. Plus, grass and weeds will grow up around your vines. In part two of this loofah growing series, I shared how I made this arch. This is a great option because it's sturdy, has lots of space, and it's just fun. But if you don't want to build or buy a structure, another option would be porch rails. Fair warning, they will take over your porch, so only plant on porch railings if you won't mind the plants everywhere. For these loofahs on the back porch, I set up a tomato cage so they could reach the height of the porch. I also grew some directly up a leg of the porch, but the loofah had a harder time grabbing on. So make sure your support has enough places for the little curly tendrils of the vine to grab on. If you plant on a porch railing, don't overplant like I did here. These vines eventually outgrew the size of the railing. Later in the season, I tried rigging up a trellis type structure with some yarn, but it just wasn't strong enough to support the weight of the vines. If you really needed to, you could trim the vines if they outgrow their support structure, but that should be a last resort because the vines need lots of leaves to get energy from the sun to develop gourds. If I had to pick a favorite support structure, I'd pick the fence panel arch. It's sturdy, it's large, and there's plenty of spots for the tendrils to grab on. And if you don't want to make an arch, a fence panel that's being used as a fence would provide great support, as would a chain link fence. A place where you should not grow loofahs is up window screen and siding. This vine on the back porch ran out of room on the railing and grabbed onto the house siding and window screen. It worked out okay until the loofah started growing. The gourds get super heavy when they're growing and the weight eventually got too much for the little tendrils that were barely attached to the siding. They slipped loose and crashed onto the porch. Yes, I lost those loofahs. Besides that, the weight damaged the window screens and it was challenging to remove the vines. Lastly, consider the soil where you are going to plant. Now, to be honest, this is not my forte at all, so I'm going to share things to consider and my experience, but take it with a grain of salt. Loofahs like a lot of water, but as with most plants, you don't want them sitting in a puddle of water. So soil that drains well is a good option. I've read mixed opinions about mulching near loofah plants, with some saying it's good because it retains moisture and warms the soil if it's darker in color, and others saying it's bad because it can lead to diseases and prevent growth. In my experience, it hasn't made a significant impact either way. The main impact I've seen from mulching is it makes weeding a little bit easier. I've planted in three different soil scenarios. The first is in good amended soil with mulch over it. The loofahs did fine, and the main problem with this area was the lack of sun, not the soil. The second place is in hard red clay. I was honestly surprised that the loofahs did so well here. I was expecting the loofahs to have a harder time in the clay soil, but they thrived despite the poor soil. 
And lastly, my rogue loofah in the garden box did phenomenal. Now this garden box was filled with lots of scrap organic material and then a thick layer of compost and planting soil, so the soil is very nutrient rich. It also drains pretty well because the soil is looser and this loofah vine really took off. This vine was my best performer and I harvested about 14 loofahs from this one vine. So as far as soil goes, it can make a difference, but don't feel like you need to spend money and buy a bunch of products to amend your soil if you don't want to. You will likely still get some loofahs even if you plant directly in whatever kind of ground you have available. Chances are you don't have a spot that's perfect for growing loofah. That's okay. I would focus on finding a sunny spot and creating a structure for the vines. If the soil isn't the best, it can always be amended. And as in my case, you can still get nice loofahs even if the soil isn't perfect. Make the best decision you can on where to plant, but don't stress about it too much. Once you know where you will plant, it's time to get loofah seeds. Stores like Lowe's and Home Depot are hit or miss whether they stock loofah seeds on their shelves, so if you can't find any in store, online is a great place to look. That's actually how I've gotten all my seeds over the years. In the past, I've ordered online through Burpee, from a random brand on Amazon, and from a seller I met in a loofah growing Facebook group. When you buy your loofah seeds, note that there are two varieties, and within those varieties there are different cultivars, which basically means they have different traits. I've always grown loofah aegyptiaca, the smooth loofah. The other variety of loofah has sharp ridges and I've heard they are harder to peel. But even within the smooth variety of loofah, there are many cultivars. Think of cultivars like types of apples. A Granny Smith apple and a Gala apple are both apples and overall they're very similar, but their taste and coloration are quite different. It's the same idea with loofahs. In the end, the gourd develops fiber and that fiber can be harvested for use as a sponge. But the shape of the loofah, thickness of the fiber, and length of the growing season can vary between loofah cultivars. I bought some different cultivars of smooth loofah, but pretty much all of them grow fairly long. The biggest differences I've gotten from various seeds is how many chambers the sponge has and how fat the sponge is overall. You don't need to worry about this too much when you're first starting. I mainly bring this up so that way if you get a different type of loofah than I grow, you aren't shocked by what ends up growing. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong, it just means we started with seeds from different types of loofahs. This won't be an option for everybody, but a great idea for getting loofah seeds is to buy from someone local. This way, the gourds are more likely to have adapted to your particular climate and soil, or at the very least, you'll know that variety can grow in your climate, and thus you might boost your odds of a good harvest. I would recommend buying anywhere from 25 to 50 seeds when you're first learning to grow loofah. You don't need to plant all the seeds you buy, but if you have extras, it gives you more chances to experiment with planting and growing. If something gets your first round of plants, you'll have extras to re-sow. I had slugs devour all of my sprouts one year, but since I had extra seeds, I was able to replant and still get loofahs. After your first successful loofah crop, you can save seeds for future plantings. I'll share more on seed saving in part 5 of this series. And now with all that prepping info out of the way, we can get to the fun stuff, actually planting the loofahs. Loofahs have a very long growing season. They like to grow for a few months before they even start creating gourds, and once the gourds are pollinated and growing, it can take a few more months until they're ready for harvest. This is a plant that definitely requires patience. The typical recommendation is 150 to 180 days or five to six months of warm weather to grow loofahs. While they can survive most temperatures above freezing, they might not thrive and put out fruit if the weather isn't warm enough. So the more warm weather you have and the hotter it is, the better. I'm going to share my timeline for growing loofahs in zone 7B, but be aware you will need to adjust your planting timeline based on where you live. Be sure to check your last frost date in the spring and your first frost date in the fall. Wait to plant or transplant outside until after the last frost date and try to harvest before the first frost date. For me, those dates usually fall around April 15th and November 15th, which gives me seven months for growing, plenty of time to get some loofahs. If your frost dates are closer together, you may want to start your seeds inside. In 2021, I started seeds indoors on April 1st with the intention to plant outdoors on May 1st. Because my germination efforts were extremely successful, they outgrew my indoor setup in the month they were inside. Let me walk you through my seed starting process and then I'll share some things to consider when deciding whether to start seeds inside or direct sow outside. For the seeds I started indoors, I first soaked the seeds in very hot water overnight. Typically you don't want to soak seeds for too long because they can mold, but I think I went a full 24 hours and my seeds were fine. While they were soaking, I made some paper pots out of old newspapers and butcher paper. 
I'll make a separate video tutorial for these since this video is already so long. I filled the pots with random potting soil I found in the garage and I also filled a couple egg cartons with soil. Then I placed them inside a plastic tub. The reason I'm using DIY paper pots and egg cartons is because loofahs do not like to be transplanted. They experience what is called transplant shock and they often pause growth for a few weeks while adjusting to their new location. By making containers that will decompose, I can plant the entire thing in the ground when I transplant and minimize how much I disturb the roots. Starting seeds in a plastic container is certainly an option, but just be aware that removing them from the container will likely disturb the roots more than the decomposing pots and may lead to a longer recovery time from transplant shock. If you have a heated grow mat, your loofah seeds will love it. I didn't have a grow mat, so instead I placed the bucket on an electric blanket, which is a terrible idea because it's definitely a safety hazard. Don't try this at home. Use something that's actually designed to be around plants that get watered. Lastly, I put a light above my pots. They're also next to a south-facing window, but everything I've ever grown indoors eventually gets leggy. So the light was an attempt to get stronger plants. By the time everything was set up, my seeds were done soaking and I was ready to plant. To plant my loofahs, I put two seeds into each little pot. However, before planting the seeds, I intentionally damaged them by removing part of the black outer shell of the seed along one side. You can use nail clippers for this step, but most of my seeds were soft enough that I could scratch into them with just my fingernail. Together, soaking the seeds and scratching them scarify the seed and make it easier for the seed to germinate. Once the seeds were scarified, I poked a half inch deep hole into the soil and dropped two loofah seeds into each hole. Cover the seeds with soil and water thoroughly. Once they sprout, you can thin each pot down to one plant, or like me, you can get two attached to each plant and leave two per pot. And then patiently wait for your seeds to sprout. Loofahs can take a really long time to germinate, and in the past, mine took several weeks to germinate. This was my first year scarifying the seeds, and it worked wonders. Four days later, nearly a third of my seeds had sprouted. Over the next few days, more seeds popped up and they took off, growing literal inches a day. Even with the window and extra light, I did have problems with my loofahs getting leggy, which just means they grow long and lean with lots of space between leaves. They do this because they are seeking light, so I moved the light closer. It slowed down the legginess a tad, but they still stretched a lot more than they do when direct sown outside. Later, I even set up a fan in a last ditch effort to prevent even more legginess. The idea is the fan moves the plant around, forcing the plant to grow stronger as it builds up resistance to the wind. I don't think it made much of a difference for legginess, but I do think it helped when I hardened them off later. At this point, it's just a matter of watering them regularly and waiting for the weather outside to be warm enough for transplanting. I gave each plant a good soaking just about every day because water is essential for the loofahs when they first start growing. It's possible to overwater, but that wasn't an issue for me because the light dried the soil somewhat quickly. When the vines got too long and flopped over, I added bamboo skewers into the pots for support. I didn't want the vines to snap and they also started getting extremely tangled, so the skewers helped with that. You might remember the seeds planted in egg cartons. Yeah, those didn't pan out because the carton was too shallow for the main deep root the loofah sends out, so they sprouted and promptly died in a couple of weeks. The root had nowhere to go and the light may have cooked them. When May rolled around, I was more than ready to get the loofahs out of my house and into the ground. In the week leading up to transplanting, I hardened off the loofahs by bringing them outside for a few hours each day. The first day, I kept them completely in the shade and only left them outside for a short time. Each day, I placed them in more sun and left them outdoors for more time. After a week of hardening, it was time to plant them in the ground. I've read mixed information about how much space to leave between plants, ranging anywhere from 8 inches to 10 feet. I think I did overcrowd my loofahs last year, so this year I'm planning to leave more space. I ended up with about two feet between plants by putting four paper pots on each side of my loofah arch. I had to first dig holes, which I did by hand only to discover weed fabric from like a decade ago, so that was fun. Not. When I dug my holes, I made them a bit deeper and wider than my pot. Another thing I probably should have done was dig the holes deep enough to bury the leggy stem of the vine up to the first pair of true leaves. This might have strengthened the plant because they wanted to flop over, but I only had so much time and energy to put into digging holes. So basically, I dug a hole, stuck the pot in there, and refilled with dirt. I also propped the vines onto the arch in hopes they would start grabbing on, then I gave them a good watering. They took their time, probably two to three weeks to get over the transplant shock, and I did lose a couple plants. Fortunately, most of them settled in and started to form new growth. 
If you don't want to start seeds inside, you can follow a similar process to sow seeds directly where you want them outside. I soaked the seeds overnight and scratched the seed coat before planting, just like when I started them indoors. When planting, you can plant loofahs and mounds as you might for other plants like pumpkins or zucchini. Hills tend to warm faster and hills can help with drainage. This isn't a necessity, however, and my planting locations aren't the most conducive for hilling, but it can help. Again, I plant the seeds a half inch deep and water regularly for the first several weeks. While germination outside might take a few more days than indoors, most of my direct sown seeds germinated within a week. In the past, it's taken several weeks for germination and I credit the scarification process for the speedier results. This year, I plan to only direct sow outdoors, mainly because starting indoors isn't a necessity for me. While it's nice to get a head start on growth, direct sowing prevents legginess and leads to stronger plants overall. Plus, transplanting takes more work. But your situation may be different than mine and starting indoors might be a great way to extend your growing season. For me, the hardest part of growing loofahs is getting the seeds to sprout and getting those first few true leaves. If you can get your plants to sprout and survive until they have three to four true leaves and are a few feet long, you and your loofah should be in good shape for the rest of the season. We now get to my favorite stage of raising loofahs and that is the growing phase. These are the months where the vines grow longer, the leaves reach the size of a dinner plate, and beautiful yellow flowers cover the plants. It's also when gourds are pollinated and start growing. Many exciting things happen with the plants at this stage, and if you become as obsessed with your loofah plants as I am with mine, you might find yourself checking on them every day or two. So let's talk about some different aspects of caring for the plants while they grow, as well as random things to keep an eye on. We've touched on this a little bit, but loofahs like lots of water. How much water they need will depend on various factors like rainfall and your soil situation, but a good rule of thumb is to water them once a week. They may need more water when they first sprout, so in the beginning you may water as much as three times a week. But in my area, once they are established, they do pretty well with a good watering weekly. Sometimes I'll give them an extra watering if the weather has been particularly dry, and other times I don't water for a couple weeks because of rain. So don't drown your plants, but in my experience, they tolerate too much water better than too little. One other note with watering. Water at the root of the plant and avoid the leaves. Moisture on the leaves can lead to rot or diseases like powdery mildew. Something that I enjoy when checking on my plants is training the vines. This simply means directing their growth on the trellis or support structure. Loofah vines send out these adorable little tendrils that curl around the trellis and hold the plant in place as it grows vertically. Sometimes the vines decide to grow along the ground instead of up the trellis, or sometimes they reach the edge of the trellis and start reaching out into the nothingness. When this happens, I like to carefully move the vine into a better position. When I move a vine, I first carefully uncurl any tendrils along the section of the vine I want to move. Then I hold the vine in position where I want it and wrap the tendrils around the adjacent sections of trellis. Sometimes the tendrils snap off, and that's okay as long as most of them don't break off. The bigger concern is that you don't move the vine too fast or in too different of a position and cause the vine itself to snap. Think of it like a piece of celery, just a little more flexible. You can bend a stalk of celery, but if you bend it too fast or too much, it will snap. The vines are the same way. Whenever I've accidentally snapped a section of the vine, it's always been because I got careless. If the vine snaps, use a pair of scissors to cleanly remove the broken section. While snapping off a section of vine is never ideal, it's not a death sentence for the vine. Once the vines feel well established and the weather cues are correct, the loofah should start to produce flowers. Before any flowers bloom, you might notice tiny bulbous buds forming along the vine. Loofah vines produce both male and female flowers. Typically, the male flowers bloom sooner than the female flowers. The males grow in clusters and bloom for one day. After they've bloomed, the flower falls off the vine and a new flower from the cluster will bloom the next day. Female flowers should start to form as the weather gets hotter. The female flowers usually don't grow in clusters like the male flowers and instead they grow with a baby gourd behind the base of the flower. Once the female flower blooms, it would develop into a gourd if it got pollinated by the male flowers. At first, it can be hard to tell the male and female flowers apart, but once your first gourd starts growing, the difference is easy to see. It's not abnormal for male flowers to bloom for a couple weeks before the first female flowers start blooming. Less common would be female flowers blooming before the male flowers. This can happen and could be a sign of nutrient deficiency. But in most cases, if the weather cooperates, your vines will reach a point where female and male flowers are blooming at the same time. 
flowers often continue to bloom until the very end of the season. Of course, we need pollinators to help us out, but you will likely find other critters on your vines as well. One I specifically want to mention in this section is ants. Quite often, you will find ants scurrying in lines up and down your vines. You might notice them on leaves, on flowers, and on the growing gourds. The first time I saw ants swarming up and down my plant, I was a little freaked out. They must be harming my plants, right? Actually, they're not. If you look at the leaves of your loofah plant, you may find little dots. These dots are slightly raised and might appear as though there's something inside of it, like a bug or a disease. Fortunately, these dots are not cause for alarm. They are extrafloral nectaries. Extrafloral nectaries is a fancy way of saying it's a spot on the plant that produces nectar but isn't a flower. While many insects like to visit these sources of sweet nutrition, ants absolutely adore them. So if you see ants all over your vines, they're likely not there to cause harm. They're just stopping by for a snack. I also see them hanging out near the female flowers, not causing any harm, but likely either resting or gathering nectar from the flower as well. The presence of the ants can also be a deterrent to more harmful critters. I'm not sure what type of ants these were on my vines last year, but fortunately the fire ants only made an appearance once or twice. Another fun thing about loofahs is they are edible. At least they are at first. When the gourds are young, about 7 inches long or smaller, the fiber hasn't started to develop yet. At this stage, the interior is like the consistency of a cucumber. The taste isn't as palatable as a cucumber in my opinion, but some varieties have a better flavor. The taste isn't terrible, but it's a very strong green flavor, and this is coming from someone who likes spinach and Swiss chard. But don't let me scare you away from trying loofah for yourself, maybe you will like it. The last thing I want to mention about the growing stage is you still have to have patience. Every step of the process takes time. It takes time for the vines to grow long, time for flowers to appear, time for gourds to start growing, and time for gourds to be ready for harvest. Try to enjoy the process. Now, despite my best efforts, I still run into the occasional problem with my loofahs. While it's important to monitor your plants, most problems aren't as bad as they first seem. Let's go over a few of these issues, as well as how to approach problems in general. The best piece of advice I can give is don't freak out. If you find your plant crawling with bugs, or the leaves look wilted, or there just aren't many flowers blooming, you don't need to automatically freak out. Often there is a simple cause behind the problem, and sometimes they even resolve on their own. Just because something seems wrong doesn't mean something actually is wrong. One example is the aforementioned ants. It might look like a bad thing to see a hundred ants crawling on your plants, but usually they cause no harm and can even be beneficial. Another example is my loofahs sometimes seemingly wilt. The lush green foliage suddenly droops and looks distressed. While there can be adverse reasons for this, such as an aphid infestation or bacterial wilt, it may just be a case of midday wilt. I often experience this, usually on the hottest days. As water evaporates from the leaves, they lose pressure and droop a little. But as the day continues and the roots bring up more water to the leaves, they perk right back up. If you experience something like wilting leaves, your best course of action is to observe and research. Here are some good questions to ask as you observe and research. Is there visible damage to the plant? What bugs have I seen on the plant recently? Does the plant recover on its own or is the situation getting worse? What were recent weather conditions? When I first started observing the droopiness, the plants bounced back every single time as the day went on. They also maintained a vibrant green color and showed no other signs of distress. As I observed the behavior in correlation with the weather, I realized they didn't droop on cloudier, cooler days and they perked up sooner with a brief watering. Armed with this information, I was able to research causes of drooping online and came to the conclusion this was a natural phenomenon because of water evaporation from the leaves and not a cause for alarm. If you still end up stumped after observing and researching, try connecting with other gardeners online and in person for additional help. I've learned a lot from others who have grown loofahs and they've helped me recognize what things are problems and what things are natural. The biggest problem you might face could come from critters, so let's touch on that before we wrap up the video. When I say critters, I'm referring to both bugs and animals. Just because you see a bug doesn't mean you need to do anything. While some can cause damage, many aren't going to bother the plant and some will even be helpful. I'm broadly going to break this into two categories. The first category I'm calling pests. These are critters that can cause harm to your loofahs. However, just because they cause harm to your plant doesn't mean you need to freak out if you see one or two. I spotted a couple Japanese beetles on my loofahs, and while they didn't take over, they are an invasive species and I caught them nibbling on the leaves a little. 
For a pest like this, I flick them into a cup of soapy water when I find them. I also had numerous grasshoppers visiting the loofahs on my arch. These nibbled the edges of the leaves, and while the damage is not ideal, they didn't stop the vines from producing gourds. These critters are too fast to flick into soapy water, so I let them be and hope the birds got them. Slugs are my least favorite pest, and they don't bother the plant as much once it's larger, but they love munching on that first set of leaves, which aren't the true leaves, but are the cotyledons from the embryo of the seed. If you find your young sprouts topped off a day or so after they sprout, it might be slugs. You might not catch the slugs in the act, so try checking your plants at different times of the day. I didn't spot my first slugs until after dark, and I was shocked by how many were around. Slugs are challenging to deal with since few products actually work, so I just stick with eggshells around the young sprouts to deter them from my plants. Various caterpillars can be a concern. I found this one, and instead of freaking out and instantly squishing it, I scooped it into a container while I researched what it was. I eventually learned it was a lesser yellow underwing moth in its larva stage. These tend to munch on garden plants, so I did end up disposing of this little fellow. In my experience, rabbits and deer mostly leave the loofahs alone. I think my cats keep the rabbits at bay, and the deer have plenty of other options for food nearby. I did have one vine that looks like deer or rabbits nibbled off the leaves, but this was an overflow branch from the garden box loofah that was growing along the ground, so it wasn't a big deal. Now, squash bugs and vine borers are a serious potential threat, and these can kill the vines in a matter of days. Fortunately, I haven't been struck by either yet. I did have a lot of squash bugs on some pumpkins last year, but they never migrated to my loofahs. This may be because of other plants nearby. There are various flowers that can act as a deterrent to squash bugs. Nasturtiums are one such plant, and while mine didn't do super well, they were present and may have kept some of these pests away. On the bright side, loofahs attract many beneficial critters and some exciting visitors. Some fun visitors include these little green anoles, a handful of praying mantises that keep pests to a minimum, and lots and lots of hummingbirds sipping from the flowers. I frequently see ants, and wasps are another common visitor. I finally made my peace with the wasp last year, and we've developed an understanding that we will just leave each other alone and live in peace. On the other hand, I can't stand the yellow jackets because of their aggressive nature, but I haven't gotten stung yet. Emphasis on yet. The flowers also attract numerous honeybees and bumblebees, which are also great for pollinating. And lastly, I spot butterflies stopping by from time to time. You never know what friends are going to show up on your loofah, so keep your eyes open. In my experience, most critters leave the loofahs alone, and the ones that aren't so friendly usually cause minimal damage. As much as I'm able, I allow critters to visit and only get rid of the most damaging insects. Your experience with critters and loofahs will also depend on your location, as this can impact what critters are around and what options you have for management. At this point, I've covered everything I wish I knew about getting my loofahs going, and everything I wish I had known about the growing season. The only steps that are left are harvesting and seed saving. In part 4, I'll cover when to harvest your loofahs, and in part 5, I'll share methods for how to harvest loofahs as well as seed collecting. When you grow loofahs for the first time, remember that it's a learning process. Don't get overwhelmed by all there is to learn. Instead, pick three or four specifics to focus on during your first planting. For instance, you could focus on 1. Scarifying your seeds 2. Creating a good trellis or structure for growing 3. Finding a good watering schedule and 4. Checking your plants every few days to observe their growth cycle. Next year, you can focus on one or two additional details and with time you will learn more about the plants and better ways to grow. Since I reached the point where I feel confident I can get the plants growing successfully, I spent some time last year playing around with fertilizing for a better crop. Not sure how much I actually learned, but it gives me a slightly better starting point for this year than I had last year. If you have any questions or aren't sure about something I talked about in this video, drop a comment below and I will do my best to help. Growing loofahs are a fun and rewarding process, and my best piece of advice is to just try. First-hand experience will clarify a lot of the things covered in this video, and it will boost your confidence in growing this plant. I hope everyone enjoys, and happy loofah growing. Smells like a bean. Smells like a bean. Yeah, I'd eat more. That's weird. I don't know. You know when you get a green bean that were from the garden, and the green bean is, like, just slightly too mushy, and you don't have that satisfying crunch? I know how it has a slightly weird dirt flavor. That's what that tastes like. But I would eat it again. I'm a dirt eater. Are you gonna <laughs> Dad, are you gonna try one? No. It tastes very green. 
But I kind of like the green view. You want to tell them, Mom? Mm -hmm. I like another one. It's kind of tasty. It tastes green. It's mushy, but not in a bad way. I can't believe I sacrificed a sponge for this.